folks, welcome to Constructive Christianity. I'm your host, Peter Demas, and today we're going to talk about Daniel. We're going to kind of dig a little bit into Daniel and see how some of the lessons that we can learn from Daniel that we can apply uh, in, in our everyday lives. But one of the questions that came up that, that I read the, the one of the first times I read the, the Bible was, was, where was Daniel? Where was Daniel during part of this problem? I mean, Daniel is is one of my heroes, and um, but but I want to highlight a part of the book that that at one time bothered me, and and I want to kind of discuss it and dig deeper into it. So in Daniel chapter three, we learn the story of Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. Now these three young men, in contradiction of the king's orders, refused to bow down to the golden statue uh, that, that 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 Nebuchadnezzar built of himself. When he saw this, he insisted that they get thrown into a fiery pit and, and where they not only did they escape unharmed, but as they were walking around in the pit, uh, there was a, a, a fourth man to appear that Nebuchadnezzar called the, that, that looked like the son of God, which we now have, have concluded and determined that that was Jesus that was walking around with them, uh, protecting them. But the question that came from this story is not about the three young men, but where was Daniel? Why did Daniel... Uh, uh, not also get thrown into the pit. Does that mean that he bowed down and worshiped the idol? Was that the, the what happened during that time? I mean, does that make any sense at all? I mean, this is Daniel. I mean, Daniel was one of the many men that was taken captive by the Babylonians, presumably as a young boy or teenager. Um, but he was able to stand up to the king's guard, to the chief of the eunuchs, and say, look, this is about my diet. Like, and, and it wasn't because the diet didn't appeal to his taste. He's not like a teenager that's like, I don't like that type of food. I don't want that food. It doesn't taste good to me. It wasn't anything in that situation. It was the situation that, 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 w- w- that he saw that, was, that was, would make him unclean. And Daniel 1.8 um, it, it says, but Daniel pro- uh, proposed in his heart that he would not defile himself with a portion of the king's delicacies, nor with the wine which he drank. Therefore, he requested of the chief of the eunuchs that he might not defile himself. The point of it was, was again, he recognized how critical it was to, to honor God and follow God. And that was through the diet at that time. And so, so Daniel, Daniel was able to not only was, was willing to risk his life, but the life of others that were, that he was speaking on behalf, but he was also, uh, even if it didn't work, he was even risking the, the chief of the eunuch's life. Um, but because of their relationship, they had, uh, the, the chief said, you can test it out and see, and Daniel was able to get it. But Daniel still was able to take that risk to confront himself. Does this seem like a person who would not bow down to, that would bow down to an idol from it? You know, when Daniel confronted the king, um, uh, after the order went out to kill all the wise men. So when Nebuchadnezzar had his first dream, Daniel went and and confronted him, but didn't confront him immediately and say, hey, here's your dream. I got your answer. Stop killing us all. I know that you're wanting to kill me. Daniel obviously couldn't just walk into the king's quarters either. He had to go to people that that knew that there was an order out to kill him. And what Daniel went to him with and said, hey, I need more time. And Daniel 2.16, it says, Daniel went and asked the king to give him time that he might tell the king the interpretation. He has more time after an order was already given to kill. I mean, can you imagine going to an ancient Near East king and saying, you know what, I know there's an order out on my life, but but I I need just need at least one more day. I mean, imagine that now if there's an arrest warrant out to you and you went into the police station and said, look, here's the deal. I know that you want to get me, but just give me one extra day and then we're all going to be good. That wouldn't happen today, much less back in that time. But Daniel was able to, to Daniel eight was able to build up enough courage and was able to stand up for something that he believed because of the faith that he had in God. Furthermore, he was able to tell the king bad news of the dream. There was the first dream of the statue that 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 kind of dealt with his kingdom and um, and and the kingdoms to come. But then there was another dream that 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 Nebuchadnezzar had, and in that dream, Daniel went to him and had to tell him the bad news. In Daniel four twenty four, uh, Daniel says, "This is the interpretation, O king, and this is the decree of the Most High, which has come upon my lord the king." They shall drive you from men. Your dwelling shall be like the beast of the field, and they shall make you eat grass like oxen. 
They shall wet you with the dew of heaven, and seven times shall pass over you, till you know that the Most High rules in the kingdom of men, and gives it to whomever he chooses. This is not what the king wanted to hear. King didn't want to hear that he was going to end up um, uh, being being uh, uh, that, that he was going to end up being like animals of the field. He didn't want to hear that. But Daniel had to go and tell him that. Now again, kings during that time were were, were pretty ruthless when they got bad news because they, they was all about them. They saw themselves as gods, and clearly Nebuchadnezzar had a pride problem already. Otherwise, God wouldn't have given him this dream and have struck him down. Daniel even told him that, look, if, he, if even if he kind of started to repent and started doing some good things, maybe that that, that he could delay the, this, this problem from it. And Nebuchadnezzar uh, clearly did not and was talking about uh, all the great stuff that he built. Um, and then eventually, um, eventually he ended up uh, uh, going crazy and um, acting like a cow eating, uh, eating grass in the field. So when King Darius was king, now this is a completely new king. He signed a law saying that he could not change that that, that could not change that no one could petition for thirty days anyone or any god except the king, and Daniel did it anyway. And Daniel knew it. Here's the thing that was great about this is in Daniel six ten it says now when Daniel knew that the writing was signed. He went home, and in his upper room, with his windows open toward Jerusalem, he knelt down on his knees three times that day, and prayed, and gave thanks before his God, as was his custom since early days. The key part to this is not only the fact that he did it, but it was when he knew that the writing was signed. Daniel stood up to the orders of that time that that was happening. So, in fact, Daniel is the only person outside of Jesus who does not have one negative thing to say about Daniel in the entire Bible. He is so squeaky clean that his opponents couldn't find anything to get Daniel with, so they made it illegal to obey God. I mean, can someone say that about you? I I know they can probably try to find other things about me outside of that. I mean, imagine how great and righteous Daniel was that they couldn't find anything wrong with him. A man who had risen to power under multiple kings had risen up to, to, to pretty high levels. And the only thing they could find to get him was the fact that he loved God so much. They knew that was the only way that they could trap him and get him in. In Daniel 6, 4 through 5, it says, So the governors and satraps sought to find some charge against Daniel concerning the kingdom, but they could find no charge or fault because he was faithful, nor were there any error or fault found in him. Then these men said, We shall not find any charge against this Daniel unless we find it against him concerning the law of his God. Even the prophet Ezekiel, who was a contemporary of Daniel's at the time, mentions how great Daniel was. God says Daniel could be saved by his righteousness. So now he goes back to that question. Why was Daniel not in the fiery pit? Why was Daniel, uh, did, did did he just, again, he would have been close to the king. He would have been near the king. Why didn't the king see him when he didn't bow down? All of this happened when, when, he, when he didn't happen. So question is, did he cave at this one point in time? I mean, I just doubt that. I mean, that's just not who he was. We see it all throughout the book of Daniel. And we see God reveal things to Daniel that we wouldn't see, that, that wasn't revealed even to some of the greater prophets of that time. You know, we, we, we learn about not only the, the, the kingdoms that come next, you know, of, and, and even to the details of understanding Alexander the Great and, and the people there. I mean, there are prophecies concerning Cleopatra that are they're hidden into the book of Daniel. But we also see in the book of Daniel prophecies of the end of times, things that haven't even happened yet that God was able to reveal to Daniel. So it's unlikely that Daniel bowed down to that idol. Um, I mean, it, it just doesn't seem to be that. Now, there are several interpretations that I read and try to understand why. And and a couple of them I kind of fell for after a while. I'm sorry, but just one of them I really kind of fell for at the time. And the most popular ones that I've seen is this, is that Daniel left so they wouldn't have to do so. That, that he saw what was happening and so he snuck out so he didn't have to do so. Another one was that he just happened to be away on God. That was just coincidence that he happened to be away on God's business. 
And the third one was, or the third one is, that, that, he, that the king sent him away because he knew what was going to happen and he did not want Daniel harmed because he loved Daniel so much. Well, let's kind of break these down really, really quick here. So do we really think that Daniel would have escaped and let other people take the punishment? Again, this is the same person that when he heard that in writing, he said, oh, I'm going to do it and open the window for all to see. It, and all he had to do was hold out for 30 days. He could have done it with the window closed for 30 days. It wasn't like the rest of his life. It was only a month. I mean, you know, that's, 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 that's less than a, than, a, than, a, than a hockey season. I mean, we, we can see so many times where we have kind of fallen apart and kind of fallen stale for longer periods of time than that. And yet, at the same time, Daniel did it immediately. He didn't just hold out or do anything with it. So I highly doubt that Daniel said, you know what, I'm just going to escape so I don't end up in this situation. Because Daniel wanted to show people his faith. Daniel had no problem telling kings, my God is bigger than you. And the only reason why you have power is because my God gave you that power. Wouldn't it be just awesome if we had people that would tell our leaders of our country and of, our, uh, uh, and of this world to look at them and say, the only reason why you have power is because of God. And so therefore, you better be serving God as the, the leader of this country. I know there are many times and many presidents in my lifetime that I would have loved to have, have, have uh, uh, been able to tell that to and I'd love to have been able to see them uh, honor God in the way they led and the way they, in the way they ruled the, the, this country. And I've seen it throughout history and other parts of this world as well. So, so I really don't think that that would have been the case. The second one was is that he was gone on King's business. Uh, there's a possibility of that. Um, and then the third one was is the king sent him away. Again, I really doubt that happened too. Because if the king sent him away um, on business, uh, then, then that seemed to be out of character for the king as well. The king wanted people to worship this idol no matter what. But nevertheless, if Daniel was gone or the king sent him away, it, that's not what the Bible says. When you read this, what the Bible says in Daniel 3, verses 2 through 3, it says, And King Nebuchadnezzar sent word to gather together the satraps, the administrators, the governors, the counselors, the treasurers, the judges, the magistrates, and all the officials of the provinces to come to the dedication of the image which King Nebuchadnezzar had set up. So the satraps, the administrators, the governors, the counselors, the treasurers, the judges, the magistrates, and all of the officials of the provinces gathered together for the dedication of the image that King Nebuchadnezzar had set up, and they stood before the image that Nebuchadnezzar had set up. This wasn't a spur-of-the-moment type thing. It wasn't like something that the king said, this is what we're going to do. Uh, this, 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 this image was, was gigantic. It was huge. And so it wasn't something that was actually kind of just discovered and they brought in and it was this little tiny thing that, that nobody could see. They had to work on it and build this idol that was there. So it wasn't, um, it, 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 and then on top of that, it was set up. It was a great event for, for Nebuchadnezzar to send this to their entire to their entire, uh, it was basically the entire world as they knew it at that time. Nebuchadnezzar had conquered all of this area. And, and he had to send people in. It wasn't like people could just get in a car and drive there or fly there in a 45-minute flight. And the longest thing you had to do was go through security in order to get on the plane. That wasn't what happened. It took days, weeks, months to be able to travel from the king's orders. Plus, the king had to send out the orders to get to these people. All of these people. Why would he send Daniel away to govern while well, everybody else had to come in. There's nothing that indicates in the Bible whatsoever that Daniel was gone. In fact, it indicates that Daniel had actually was there as well with all of the officers, all of the people that came in. So sometimes when we read the Bible, we, we read it with the images that we've seen in picture books, maybe in movies, uh, but, but we, we, we visualize it from the way that sometimes they, 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 they do it in order for us to see and understand it. Um, and uh, sometimes we, we read it from the stories of the pulpit that something that God might have, uh, I'm sorry, that, that something that the preacher might have painted that wasn't necessarily in the Word of God. It might be just slight, slightly off, but it didn't take away from the message that the preacher said, but not, might not be there. And then all of a sudden we have this image into our head for that point in time. 
This story is a classic case of this. At the beginning, this is what I stated, and I quote, In Daniel chapter 3, we hear the story of Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. These three young men, in contradiction to the king's orders, refused to bow down to the golden statue he built of himself. When he saw this, he insisted they get thrown into a fiery pit, where not only did they escape unharmed, but a fourth man appeared that the king said had the image of the Son of God. And this is what I had been taught. But that's not what the Word of God says. First of all, we don't know what the golden statue says. Many assume it was of the king um, and, and, and that he made to contradict God's dream of itself. Many just assumed it was of the king itself, but it doesn't say that. Some have even proposed that the golden image was of Daniel. They, they, they pull from Daniel 2 when after Daniel gives the, 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 the interpretation of the dream that Nebuchadnezzar bows down in front of Daniel and, and, and worships him. Um, and so they, they said, well, that means that Nebuchadnezzar made Daniel a god, and therefore he made this big statue of Daniel. But we have no idea what it is. Again, I highly doubt that's the case. I doubt Nebuchadnezzar was worshiping uh, somebody who, who was his slave um, and, and, uh, and was treated in, in such a fashion. But at the same time, we have no idea what it was. All we know was that it was a golden image and that it was very tall. There was no more details on this. We have no earthly idea what that golden image was. In three one, in Daniel three one, it says Nebuchadnezzar the king made its image of gold, whose height was sixty cubits and its width six cubits. He set it up on the plain of Dura in the province of Babylon. So that's all it says about the golden image at all. Now it does not say that 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 he saw. The, the the king that the I'm sorry he does not say that the king saw the boys bowing down to it, the three boys were actually accused. Now again, looking in Daniel chapter three verses eight uh, eight uh, 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 forward, it says therefore at that time certain Chaldeans came forward and accused the Jews. They spoke and said to King Nebuchadnezzar, O king, live forever. You, O king, have made a decree that everyone who hears the sound of the horn, flute, harp, lyre, and psaltery and symphony with all kinds of music shall fall down and worship the gold image. And whoever does not fall down and worship shall be cast into the midst of a burning fiery furnace. There are certain Jews whom you've set over the affairs of the province of Babylon, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. These men, O king, have not paid due respect regard to you. They do not serve your gods or worship the gold image which you have set up. Then Nebuchadnezzar, in rage and fury, gave the command to bring Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. So they brought these men before the king. So it does not say anywhere in there that that uh, that that he saw them do it. In fact, it even says the exact opposite. Men had to come and accuse Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego of not bowing down. Now, again, we don't know why these men were accused. Now, I can interpret this too in the first eight. It says, therefore, at that time, certain Chaldeans came forward and accused the Jews. But it doesn't say necessarily it accused just only those three. Even though, I'm sorry, it does say they accused only those three later. But it doesn't say that they were the only ones that didn't do it. It didn't say that, 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 that they were the only ones that, that stood tall. But at the same time, what I am looking at is this, is that the king did not see them and the king, uh, uh, that other people came and accused them. Now, again, we also don't know the reason why. Maybe they wanted to take Daniel's supporters away. Maybe this was a whole point of them just getting more power and getting closer to the king. Maybe you know they just wanted to position themselves. Um, further, since we know that these three were accused and no one else was accused, uh, that that that's that's all we know. But again, it doesn't limit anything else that might have been happening at that point in time. We just know an accusation was made. And further, since we can deduce that Daniel was present based off of the other 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 information in there, that he would, and we can deduce that he would not have bowed down to the statue. We can also deduce that these three were not the only ones that didn't bow down. But again, we don't know this. This is something that we can just interpret from, from, this, from, from the passages in there. But further evidence that the king did not see them continues in verse 14. Nebuchadnezzar spoke and saying to them, is it, true, is it true, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, that you do not serve my gods or worship the gold image which I have set up? He tries to offer them a way out. 
and says that he would allow them to do it again. And they said, and, 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 and they said uh, later in verse 16, it says, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego answered and said to the king, O Nebuchadnezzar, we have no need to answer you in this matter. If that is the case, our God, whom we serve, is able to deliver us from the burning, fiery furnace, and he will deliver us from your hand, O king. But if not, let it be known to you, O king, that we do not serve your gods, nor will we worship the golden image which you have set up. They did not lie. They didn't try to get out of it. They flat said, we won't do it. And here's the reason why. They even just told their, they, they even just admitted that their accusers was correct. Which leads to a side issue. Why did they not bow down to the idol? I mean, let's let's look at the Ten Commandments for a moment, because part of the 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 Jews that, that were there were were more faithful, um, and they followed the law that God had given to Moses all the way down. These would be the laws of Leviticus, Numbers, Deuteronomy, but part of those laws uh, was uh, was summarized in the Ten Commandments. Now. In the Ten Commandments, there, there are two commandments in particular this deals with. One, there should be no other God and there should be no graven image. But the, here's the problem is there's a conflicting law that says they must bow down to the gold statue. So what do you do when there is a law that says you must do this and there is a law that says God says you, you, you must do this? Well, they had to know that God was greater than the law of the land. They had to know that the law of the almighty God would supersede the law of the land. And they had to follow that. So many times we fall into the trap of saying, well, we need to be respectful to the laws of the land. We need to be respectful for our leaders. We need to do all this other stuff. Well, you see Daniel, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, they were never at any point in time disrespectful to any of the kings. In any of the examples I gave you of Daniel, and in this particular situation with Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, they they were not disrespectful, but they just said, look, we have to follow the laws of God. In Acts 5.29, we see the the, the, the apostles, uh, when, they, when they're told that they can't preach about Jesus, said, we have to follow the laws of God and not man. So, so they are following God and not man. In this particular situation, it's the exact same thing. Remember that they recognized that, that the faith they had in God was greater than any law. Now, these people, again, were in captivity. They knew the dangers that, that would be facing for them. And it'd be very easy for them to think that God had failed them. I mean, how many times, again, in your life do you think, well, you know, this didn't go my way, so, so God failed me in this area. This didn't go my way. Um, and, uh, and, and so I don't have the, the answer that I wanted to have. And so it kind of leads to that f- doubting faith type moment. At that time in, in, ancient, uh, uh, in, in ancient Middle Eastern times, many people felt that if a country was conquered, meant that their gods conquered the other gods, that, that that's really what was happening during that point in time. And in this particular situation, as we know, reading through the Old Testament prophets, reading in the book of Kings and Chronicles, what we see is we see where, where, God, you know, where God says, basically, I'm allowing them to do it. God just basically stepped aside and allowed them to be captive. But they still worshiped God. They still knew that he ruled, that he was, that, that he was on the throne forever. But the other thing to remember is this, is the law doesn't make people do something. You know, they, they, they had to know who God was and they had to follow his law. We mess up all the time. We mess up with the Ten Commandments all the time. We mess up on many of the other moral laws that have stand, stood the test of time, no matter, no, no matter what has happened before or since. And we mess that up all the time. We're not perfect. That's why we need a Christ. That's why we need the Christ because we're not perfect. The reason why we needed him to come and die on the cross for us is because we're not perfect. Because we have sinned and he's forgiven us for our sins. He's taken that sin away from us and we know that. And so because we know that, that's the reason why we follow Christ. Not because there are certain things that says you can't do this. 
Otherwise, we're going to be stuck in the fact of, you know, why we can't eat pork and when, why we, uh, but, but, but we, we can do this. I mean, there's all this stuff that's in there. The Bible has certain things in there that the Holy Spirit has led that stands the test of time. These are certain moral laws that stand the test of time. The laws concerning sexuality, the laws concerning uh, um, uh, uh, violence, uh, and and against uh, and those laws against people like that, those are moral laws that stand the test of time. But there are other laws concerning when to sacrifice a goat. Those are things that we don't need. Jesus has taken that away. Um, he's taken that away on the cross. So these three young men had a relationship with God, and they were willing to stand up. I mean, they were part of Daniel's prayer team that helped them get promoted to this position, and they were part of Daniel's prayer team that helped save their life. Having a relationship with God, spending time in his presence, spending time in his word will allow you to stand up in the face of adversity. There's so many times we're facing, the, we, we're faced with adversity and we fold and we collapse. And the adversity doesn't even have to be this big. It doesn't have to mean that somebody who has the power to kill us, but sometimes it's standing in the face of adversity of being afraid of being made fun of. And we fall under that trap of being made fun of and we fail in that. And part of that is, is because we aren't spending enough time in the word of God and having that relationship with Jesus in order to know the faithfulness that he has to give us the strength and power to stand up in the faces of those who tell us that we are wrong. So let's go back to these three men. They were accused truthfully and factually, but they were accused. You will be accused at times, and sometimes it won't seem fair. You'll be accused on something you did that was right, but other people did it, and they didn't get accused. We're seeing that in our political world today. Why is this man getting accused of something that this man did? Why is this man getting accused of something that this person did and is not being accused? We see that everywhere in the political world. It's kind of a very childish way of looking at the way life works. It's not fair. I've been accused of things that I said that was false, and I've been accused of things that I said that were true. And both times I have done that same whiny, it's not fair. I understand that emotion, that feeling that's coming out. But that doesn't necessarily mean that, 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 it, that the, we don't have to deal with the accusations. Just because we don't think it's fair doesn't mean we get to stick our head in the sand. So how do we respond to these accusations? How do we respond in this situation? So the first thing is, is we have to accept our fate and trust God. Look at what they said. If that is the case, our God whom we serve is able to deliver us from the burning fiery furnace and he will deliver us from your hand, O king. But if not, let it be known to you, O king, that we will not serve your gods, nor will we worship the gold image which you have set up. If not, they recognize the possibility that, that God may not let them make just let them go ahead and, and have the fate that he set forth for them. The second thing we do is we use this opportunity to preach the gospel. We see this with Paul when Paul is arrested and he is accused and he's in front of Agrippa. His defense was the story of his conversion and then he tells them about Jesus. I mean, we see Jesus is falsely accused and he talks to the pilot about the power he has, which leads us to number three. The third thing we do is we speak the truth. We speak the truth. We state what we did and what we didn't do in spite of the consequences that comes out. Because there will be consequences. But we also know there's going to be consequences in following Jesus. The fourth thing we do is we will trust God to deal with those who are falsely accused. We can see several consequences in the Bible of this. Judas was overwhelmed with regret and remorse that he, and so that he killed himself. But Saul was used by God, converted, and became the leading advocate for spreading the gospel to the Gentile nation. We have to trust God to deal with those who are falsely accused. We don't, again, know how he's going to do it. Judas falsely accused, Saul falsely accused, went two completely different directions. And lastly, we are to forgive and bless them. Jesus on the cross said, Father, forgive them for they know not what they do. That's in Luke 24, or 23, 34. And in Matthew, on the Sermon of the Mount, Matthew 5, 11 and 12, it says, Blessed are you when people falsely say all kinds of evil against you because of me. Rejoice and be glad, because great is your reward in heaven. I encourage you to stand strong and, to, and, to, and just to keep the faith, no matter what the accusations are, and, and, and encourage you to spend time in the Word of God and dig deep into what the Word of God says. So let us pray. Heavenly Father, we just pray for the people that are here. We pray that you heal those who are sick. We pray those that, that, 
um, that are that are in need uh, of you right now. And Father, we pray those who are facing adversity. We pray that 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 you give them the strength that to have. Father, we ask that as people read the Bible, that you reveal it in such a way that 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 that, that it changes. Uh, changes them and changes uh, the way that they understand and see you into a more close relationship with you so that they understand and know what your word is and what you're wanting them to do in, in a supernatural way. Father, we pray for revival to come into this world and to be able to stand up against the evil and the lawlessness that is facing this world right now. And we pray all these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Yeah.